Hey folks, it's time to review the last couple of months, especially Diwali. We all love Diwali, right? There are lights, plans, travels, get-togethers, shopping, cleaning homes, so on and so forth. But have you ever wondered about the economic impact of this vibrant festival? Well, you are in for a treat as we dive into the world of Diwali nomics in today's special episode. Now, let's talk about something we all can relate to, sweets and weight gain. According to HealthifyMe.com's report, during last year's Diwali, overall sugar consumption of average Indians shot up by 32% and on average they have gained 1.5 kgs too. Can you blame them? See, it was the first healthy Diwali after two long years and we all crave for those delicious kaju katlis yaar. Besides, the report also reveals that people started working out and they have kind of managed to get back in shape again. So, it's all about balance, right? Speaking of balance, we should also maintain balance in our portfolio and multi-asset mutual funds can help us do it. Did you see my last video on multi-asset mutual funds? I have shared my working sheet also that will help you find the best schemes that exist as of today. So, if you haven't watched it yet, then it's time that you watch after this video. Okay, okay. Back to Diwali. We will now get into the nitty gritties of Diwali nomics. So, get a cup of coffee as you watch it. But while doing that, I humbly request you to please like this video and subscribe to the channel. So, let's start with the auto sector. Ministry of Road Transport's dashboard reveals surge in vehicle registrations during October and November this year. Around 5 million or 50 lakh vehicles were registered in October and November 2023 together, surpassing the previous year's 4.7 million. You can see in this chart that in the last couple of years, average registrations were increased over and above the pre-pandemic peak. So, a good news from an auto point of view. Now that we have bought vehicles, what are the next plans? We want to have a ride, right? And what happens then? Yes, yes, I know, apni kursi ki piti bandhni hogi, but as you hit the road, you have to pay the toll. While the adoption of fast tags is on the rise, surprisingly, there's a slight dip in toll payments during actual Diwali days. This is the chart for the volume of tolls paid and not the value. You can find that slight drop in the volume of tolls in the shaded region, that is the five days of Diwali. That means, not many people cross toll nakas during that period. Either they had already travelled or they will travel later. Then, looking at the monthly data, it turns out that the volume of tolls does not drastically change during the Diwali month. Diwali month is shown in a bar which has a Diya image in it. Now, let's shift gears to digital transactions. Did you know that during the six days of Diwali this year, UPI transactions totaled a staggering 3.4 trillion rupees? That's more than annual GDP of Uttarakhand for FY23. And the best part, the trend is on the rise, showcasing a steady increase in digital transactions not just during Diwali but throughout October and November months. In this chart, I have shown how much on average people transact daily. One bar is for October and November months combined and one bar is only for the Diwali period. It shows us that people use UPI on a similar level whether it is Diwali or not. So, here's three cheers for UPI. Now, from UPI, let's move on to one of the plastic monies, credit cards. Here, we can see that in general, people transact less on credit cards during Diwali compared to daily average during October and November. But we can see in the chart that people love using credit cards a lot and over the years its usage has increased. But the trend is completely opposite with its brother debit cards. During Diwali days, it is used more than during October and November. Also, it feels like people are using it lesser and lesser every year. I don't know what's happening, but that is surprising. Let's see how much electricity we are using. We consumed 22,483 million units of electricity during 6 days of Diwali this year. One unit is equal to 1 kilowatt per hour of energy. But this consumption is not uniform across the country. Western region consumes the most, followed by North, then South, then East and then Northeast. North and South are almost at the same level. 
the inner circle in this pie chart is for the year 2013 and the outer circle is for the 2023. As you can see over the last decade, the regional shares have not changed much. Let's see how much on average we consume every day during this festival of lights. The all India daily average trend is a bit different. It shows that from 2013 to 2018, the trend was increasing and in 2019, it fell sharply and then post that, it started rising. But it was surprising to me that it is not 2020 but 2019 where we have seen fall in electricity consumption. But in the north, average consumption fell in 2018 only and it did not recover until last year. In the west, the trend is similar to all India average. In the south, it fell in 2017 itself and then paced up a little in 2018 and then again fell in 2019. Since then, it has been rising. The east is similar to the west. The only problem is that in 2023, the consumption has decreased compared to the last year. In the northeast, it fell in 2018 itself, just like what we have seen in the case of northern region. All in all, the overall trend has been rising after a blip in 2019. Now, from electricity, let us move on to stock markets. How do you think stock markets perform during Diwali? Contrary to the expectations, stock markets don't witness significant jumps during Diwali days. However, a fascinating insight reveals that a long-term investment made on the first day of Diwali every year could yield an average gain of 12%. Now, that's a financial spark to celebrate, right? Let us see how much currency gets circulated on Diwali. This year, Diwali was from 10th November to 15th November. And as of 17th November, 33.5 trillion rupees of currency was in circulation. On 3rd November, which is a week before Diwali, it was close to 33.1 trillion rupees. So within a week, 40,000 crore rupees were added which is roughly Sikkim state GDP for FY23. But if we look at a longer period of data, it shows that on average, less than 1.5% of currency is added every year pre-Diwali to Diwali week. Now, let's unwrap the Diwali business box. Based on the confederation of all India traders' estimates, Indian retailers might have made a business of roughly 4 to 5 lakh crores or 4 to 5 trillion rupees this Diwali. And it says that it has been higher than the last year. The main items included food, grocery, textile, garments, jewelry and electronics. Then post Diwali, there was a Black Friday sale also. That has also received an overwhelming response compared to the previous year. The report mentioned that tier 3 towns saw highest growth in activity. This was also observed on Amazon's Great Indian Festival sale. Around 80% of Amazon's customers during these months were from smaller towns. One thing is clear. This year, online has become a big game changer. Grant Thornton Bharat, a consultancy firm, mentioned that this year, 50% of total festive sales have come from online channels. Last year, it was 45%. Total gross merchandise value for the festive month is estimated to be around 10 to 11 billion dollars. That is roughly 90,000 crore rupees. By the way, GMV or the gross merchandise value is overall sales by merchants on e-commerce platforms without factoring discounts. Another striking trend observed during this year's festive season sale was a rise in prepaid orders compared to the last year. Now you know what those increased UPI and credit card transactions were for. But everything has a flip side to it. Online shoppers have used cheaper EMI facilities and personal loans. I think it was used way too much this time. We can see a rise in unsecured retail loans and personal loans. In November, RBI raised risk weights on these loans so that banks are discouraged from giving cheaper loans on such items. RBI has safeguarded banks by doing this. But two things, however, gave some confidence. One was GST collections and second was industrial production. GST collections for October and November were strong. Index of industrial production, the IIP data until October has been robust. November data will be released in January. Together, they convey that in anticipation of good demand conditions during the festive season, production has been robust. 
e-way bill data shows that a lot of goods have been transported to cater to this demand. And GST collections also show that they have been consumed too, but things have not been as strong as expected. The Mint article reported that offline sellers of apparel, lifestyle and consumer goods experienced that people at the mass end of the market have not spent much. ITC's executive director B. Sumanth said, I think the stress in the economy is what is affecting the bottom of the economy. At the top of the economy, people have money and they are buying. But you need everyone to buy. We are seeing some of that strain. Dhairya Shil Patil, president of All India Consumer Products Distributors Federation, said festive season was largely okay and not as expected. Distributors are still sitting on a lot of inventory. Largely, every news article says that most of the action is in high value market. Middle class and poor people have tightened their purses. And that is largely due to inflation. Unseasonal monsoon has pushed up the food prices. People have been cautious about spending too much now. They are buying low ticket items like clothes, budget phones and beauty products. But they are postponing high value items like washing machines or fridge or even some expensive gifts. Due to erratic weather, rural incomes have been hit hard and therefore we see weak rural demand in the market. Wait, so you mean production in October was high? Orders were given and all the stock had reached retail shopkeepers. But now we are seeing that people are not buying. What does that mean? That means there's a lot of unsold stock lying at the retailer. How does it affect them? They have to store it, right? So inventory cost goes up. That means they have to tell their suppliers not to send more stuff until the old stock is off their shelves. That means the companies are not selling to wholesalers or distributors. They are waiting for retailer's stock to clear. Now, for a retailer, a weak demand means no cash or low cash. That means he or she will not be able to repay the suppliers on time, which translates into lengthened credit period. Earlier, if the supplier was getting paid in 7 to 10 days, now he or she is getting paid in 20 to 25 days. So, supplier's working capital will also be in trouble. Working capital is the amount you are expecting to receive from customers minus the amount that you have to pay to creditors. Working capital issues across industries can break supply chains. Now, a side effect that you might have experienced is shrinkflation. That is, companies keep the prices same but reduce the quantity. Since the sizes of food packets shrunk, it is called shrinkflation. Companies do it because they cannot increase their prices as they know that they will lose their customer. Therefore, many companies follow this or they introduce something called as bridge packets. That is a mid-size packet which is affordable to many people. So, all in all, the problems are not a very exciting festive season, weak demand, weak rural economy, inflation and excess stock with retailers. It is difficult to predict how this will unfold. Positives include general election. Then, if the global economy bounces back, things can be streamlined. Another aspect that can improve the situation is inflation. If food prices cool down, then that will not only help common people, but also RBI. In terms of economic growth, I think in Q3, we might deliver a 6.5% growth rate as predicted by RBI. If the situation does not improve, then the GDP growth rates will be even lower until the consumer demand situation improves or prices come under control. Finally, how do we understand these trends? My suggestion is to read the comments from FMCG companies. They are the first ones to understand how the rural and urban economies are functioning. That's it for this episode. I would like to hear your thoughts about Diwalinomics. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you and see you next week.